Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network for short. Um, this webinar is brought to you today by the EBM Tools Network, uh, which is coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. And also with me today, helping to co-host, we have Nick Weiner and John Davis from Open Channels. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome our, our speakers today. We have Chantal Clark Samuels, who is CEO of the Belize Coastal Zone Management Authority. We have Katie Arkema from Stanford University, and Greg Barutas from WWF. And they're going to be talking about how ecosystem services valuation informs the visionary Belize uh, Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan. Um, before we turn it over, we're going uh, to, we'll have Chantal speaking to us first. Um, before we turn it over, I want to let everyone know that uh, our presentation will run for about 40 minutes, and more or less, and then we'll have the remaining time for questions. And we highly encourage you to ask questions. Uh, you can ask questions during the presentation uh, by typing them into the question panel of the user interface. Um, substantive questions we'll uh, hold for the the Q&A portion at the end, and just quick clarifying questions we may be able to ask the speakers while they're presenting. Um, but again, we encourage you to send in questions uh, about the, the presentation, and also um, all the questions will be relayed to the speakers at the end, so even if we aren't able to get to all the questions, the, the speakers will be, have a chance to see them. Okay, well thank you so much guys. Um, Chantal, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay. Good morning, or if you're on the East Coast, I guess it's good afternoon to all. Thank you for joining us and for your interest in the topic on ecosystem services valuation and how it helps to inform Belize's first ever integrated coastal zone management plan. I will get started by providing you with some background and context for why Belize um, developed its integrated coastal zone management plan. Dr. Katie Arkema of the Natural Capital Project will then discuss the approaches, the ecosystem services evaluation approach in particular. And then we'll have um, Greg Baruta, also from Natural Capital Project, running up the presentation and giving some applications of ecosystem services valuation in other regions of the world. So to start out, um, I just want to briefly um, state that the Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute was established in 1998 and it has a mandate for integrated coastal zone management in Belize and its function really is focused on technical coordination and policy development to inform and improve the governance over the utilization and conservation of resources within the coastal zone of Belize. And there is your our, our mission to lead the sustainable use and plan development of Belize's coastal resources through increased knowledge and the building of alliances for the benefit of Belizeans and the global community. And time permitting, I just wanted to also state that the whole notion of integrated coastal zone management is in Belize was spurred um, at a historic meeting in 1989 that took place at San Pedro um, and Burgess Key. And the impetus for that was um, the consideration of the boom of the tourism sector, which was heavily reliant and still is on the marine um, resources that we have and so the economic development of that sector was moving far um, ahead of the sustainable management of the resources base and so in consideration of a suite of issues that arose from that particular use um, there was this call for integrated coastal zone management and so the, the rest is history. We you may all know that Belize is geographically located in the heart of Central America. It's also a member state of CARICOM, which means it's a part of the Caribbean. It's a nation blessed with natural and cultural assets and a diverse portfolio of ecosystem services from which its people benefit and those across the, the, the globe. Um, about seven years ago, a study on the economic benefits Belize derives from its coastal capital and particularly its reef 
and mangroves was, um, was done. And as you can see on the slide, in terms of the tourism sector, um, the economic contribution is within the range of 150 to 196 million US dollars per year. Uh, fisheries, US 14 million to 16 million dollars per year. And shoreline protection, protection from storms, um, which are very vulnerable, um, which we believe is very vulnerable um, for this. US 231 to 347 million dollars per year. So the point is that we recognize its wealth, we recognize its contribution um, not only to our GDP but also in terms of protection of, of property and lives. The, the marine ecosystem plays a very important role that cannot be dispensed with. And as a result of the realization of the wealth available in our coastal zone, people reap the benefit through their involvement in a host of activities. And so this slide is just a simplified cartoon to provide a snapshot of the range of uses, the resources within the, the coastal and marine area. And as you can imagine, with multiple uses and multiple users, um, there are bound, there's bound to be conflicts and conflicting uses. And managing conflicting uses is one challenge, but also managing overlapping jurisdictions and mandate is an even greater challenge in Belize. And I just want to walk you through some, some of these overlaps in space, and I will discuss how the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan helps to resolve some of these conflicting issues and overlapping mandate. So in orange on your screen, we've um, mapped out the mandate of the, the Coastal Zone Management Operation Institute as defined by our legislation. So in orange, this is the area that we have planning mandate for. This is the coastal zone of Belize. And to add to that, you have the fisheries department, which is shown in blue there. They also have a mandate as defined by their legislation. Um, the petroleum department, they're in green. The lands department, they're responsible for all coastal lands um, offshore. And then in that hatch, green and, sorry, yellow and gray, you have the forest department. Um, they're responsible for um, forest reserves that fall within the coastal areas of Belize. The Department of the Environment, the Belize Port Authority in terms of transportation. Then you have NGOs and a, a, a wide variety of them that have co-management agreements um, that empower them to make certain decisions and actions in consultation, of course, with the, the um, agencies that they have the agreements with, but they are also in the mix. And then in the hatch, that's the new Ministry of Agriculture, Forestry, Fisheries, Environment, and Sustainable Development. And so the point is that, sorry, I'm going to move ahead a couple of slides, that it's one thing to have to manage the, the, the users, such as fisher folk and those in tour operators, but it's another complexity to have to bring to the table all of those government entities, departments that also have mandates, and, and how do we resolve those conflicts? And because of the wealth of the resources, um, you know, given the current value of our natural and capital assets, we know we know that we need to maintain um, this value in perpetuity for future generations. Um, and so, the people of Belize have articulated a long-term vision for our coast through our consultative process, and that vision is a sustainable future where healthy ecosystems support and are supported by thriving local communities and a vibrant economy. And the integrated coastal zone management is one such approach that will help us to um, attain that vision. And it's a national cooperative approach to integrate the interests of all sectors, facilitate inter-coordination and decision making, which is central to the mandate of coastal zones. Coastal zone, um, after 18 years in the making, finally 
developed and had its integrated coastal zone management plan adopted by the cabinet of Belize. And it's a first world country, it's a first world region, and even UNESCO refers to it as a visionary plan. And so what is the integrated coastal zone management plan? It's a planning framework that calls for national action to improve management of the resources, um, maintain the, the integrity of ecosystems, while also taking into consideration that people do derive benefit from the suite of ecosystem services um, provided from the ecosystems. And we want to ensure that that is that can be maintained in perpetuity for present and future generations of not only Belizeans but the global community. And so in a nutshell, it, pre, it represents a paradigm shift from sectoral planning to integrated um, and more coordinated management of the coastal zone. I won't get into the details, but this is really that framework that I refer to. And as you can see, it has four strategic objectives, and the suite of topical areas that are covered in the coastal plan. The plan also includes an implementation and action plan um, really to coordinate state and non-state um, actors and actions that are required. Um, you might not see it here, but it also we know that in implementing any plan, it has budgetary implications. So we've also taken the time to, to include that as well so that we know whether certain activities are feasible or not given the, the resource constraints. And the plan also has a built-in monitoring protocol, which I can take questions on after um, the presentation. Having a built-in monitoring protocol really to evaluate the progress towards meeting targets or plan in the plan. And the plan has two levels. There's a, a national plan that looks at broad policy action as well as localized um, region-specific coastal zone management guidelines. In terms of the approach, um, I will talk about two of those approaches and then I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Arkma. Um, but I just want to start by saying that it's mandated for us, at Coast, it was mandated for us at Coastal Zone to take into consideration all national legislation, policies, strategies, and action plans that will have some bearing on this decision making and management decisions in, in this plan. And so we undertook a comprehensive um, review of all those existing planning, legislation, policies, strategies, and plans. This process, um, as I mentioned, has been 18 years in the making. So there are those even before myself who started this process and left a very strong foundation for us to build upon in the last five years. Another key component um, to their approach is stakeholder engagement. So this map shows you um, the country of Belize and to the right of the, the, the map in gray are nine coastal planning regions, which also um, is aligned with the jurisdictional boundaries that cover the coastal zone of Belize, for which uh, my organization is responsible for. Um, the regions have, there are nine specific um, coastal planning regions. And when we talk about stakeholder engagement, we need to ensure that we, we visit those regions or we have representation of the interests of those regions as they affect um, coastal zone management and planning decisions. And just to add, um, these regions were divided based on geographical, biological, administrative, and economic similarities. So my final slide before I tra we transition to the ecosystem services valuation um, approach is that we've um, engaged with stakeholders um, at both a national level and at regional levels um, since 2010 to 20, September 2015. So that has been five years of consultations. 
we formed these regional coastal advisory committees per regions, and we've held approximately 15 meetings, 50 meetings during that five-year time period. Um, we've had 17 public meetings, so these are um, centered, they, they were centered on inviting the general public at large. We had two public inspection periods. Now these public inspection periods are mandated by legislation and um, we held one in 2013 when we had finished the first comprehensive draft of the plan. But the coastal zone management had some administrative challenges where we were operating without um, a board of directors. Um, and so we still held that, that public inspection period because we felt that it was very important to, to, to get the, the input on revising that draft. However, once we were able to overcome the administrative challenges um, at, at the level of our ministry, we did have a very functional, and we still have a very functional and engaged board, and we we did the public inspection period and, and we got very good um, inputs, but the, the take home point here is that stakeholder engagement is important and the, the plan that um, was eventually adopted by our cabinet earlier this year was not one made for and by coastal zone, but stakeholder input was very critical and we made sure to engage them throughout all um, stages of the um, planning process. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Arkema. Okay, and switched over to Katie. Yep. Okay. Sarah, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay. So, um, as Chantal said, the, um, sort of one of the really um, important and foundational parts of this process was the extent of stakeholder engagement that um, CZMAI engaged in over the course of really five to six years, um, building on that much longer foundation of engagement. And so um, one of our primary goals uh, at the Natural Capital Project and through our collaboration with um, the Coastal Zone Management Authority and Institute was to ensure that our um, approach of developing um, future uh, um, integrated coastal zone management plan scenarios and economic valuation of ecosystem services was embedded within that stakeholder engagement process. And early on in the, the, that process, through um, several meetings that Chantal led, um, we asked a series of questions um, of uh, the various coastal um, advisory committees and the public consul, the public through these public consultations. And one set of questions was around what are the sectors and what are the human activities that are occurring um, in the coastal zone and the offshore marine areas that um, people and that the, the Belizeans and the, and the public want to make sure to manage for. And we identified um, a set of categories and you can see these um, sort of eight different kinds of, of uses and um, potential um, uh, sort of activities that need to be managed for here on the right-hand side in the different colors. And um, based on the wealth of knowledge that has been learned about coastal zone management and marine spatial planning around the globe, we realized and we sort of knew that we needed to start at um, a high enough level, that one of the things that can really hamstring these processes is if um, you try to get too detailed too fast. So you can see that each one of these categories clearly has um, sort of subcategories within it. For example, marine transportation includes a s various different types of activities from water taxis to cruise ships. Um, and those kinds of details can then 
be resolved um, through time and through adaptive management as needed. But we wanted to keep these zones and these, these categories of activities distinct enough as a starting place um, in order to communicate clearly where these different activities could occur. So um, a series of questions from stakeholders about which activities were most important, and we elicited those responses um, through discussion. Uh, a second question that we wanted to um, understand was where are these activities occurring now and what are, what are your visions and what are your ideas about where these activities should occur in the future. And so the maps that you see are based on, um, again, uh, in part the elicitation of information and local knowledge from stakeholders, in part from satellite imagery, in part from data that was housed by a variety of different ministries and departments within the um, Belizean government. So we compiled all these kinds of spatial data um, from databases and from local knowledge um, into maps of both the current distribution of activities, as Chantal showed earlier on, and then we created um, potential alternative maps depicting a future under different scenarios. And so um, different stakeholders and different um, uh, decision makers, different scientists, we all have different ideas about how the future should look. And so the idea was that um, we would create these three scenarios that reflected different ideas about the future. And within these different ideas about the future, there's lots of smaller details. For example, where should certain marinas be built? Or what areas need to have certain kinds of um, industry or certain kinds of tourism options? But again, we needed to, to start at this larger scale of these um, sectors. And so these, um, these scenarios, um, the conservation scenario represents a vision of long-term ecosystem health through sustainable use and investment in conservation. The informed management scenario blends strong conservation goals with current and future needs for coastal development and um, marine uses. And the development scenario prioritizes immediate development needs over long-term sustainable use and future benefits. Um, and these scenarios also include um, existing proposals that have been put before, development proposals that have been put before the Belizean government. So, for example, in the development scenario, there, it includes a actual um, proposals of new development areas, and part of the idea is then to be able to use ecosystem service valuation to understand how these different scenarios would change the things that people care about in the future. So, um, I'm, let's see, I'm forwarding to my next slide, which you should see now um, four pictures of the um, objectives that we heard from stakeholders um, that they cared most about and that they wanted to track during this planning process. So, there were three ecosystem service um, metrics that served as shared objectives that people cared about. One was fisheries, one was storm protection, one was recreation and tourism. And as Chantal showed earlier, there had been previous analyses that had been done, um, led by WRI and, and WWF and others, quantifying these three different ecosystem services for the current um, situation, our current scenario. And what we um, sort of understood from Chantal and her team and what had been laid out in the Coastal Zone Management Act back in the late 90s was that the vision for the Integrated Coastal Zone Management Plan would be that it would help um, the public and help the government understand how the decisions that would make that could be made now would impact the benefits of ecosystems for Belizeans in the future. So we needed to go a step beyond the current snapshot and be able to quantify these ecosystem services under those future scenarios that I just showed. 
I think there's been a lot of discussion recently in the conservation community and in the academic literature about um, whether or not a lot of these processes should be based on um, sort of benefits for people and to what extent um, that um, we need to take into account potential effects on ecosystems irrespective of people. And I think one of the really um, sort of uh, forward thinking parts of this um, process is that, and, and one of the things we really learned from the stakeholders is that people want both. So they want to understand how ecosystems are going to help support the things they care about, like fisheries, protection from storms and tourism. But they also want to know to what extent are these ecosystems like coral reefs, mangroves, and seagrass going to be affected under these future scenarios, irrespective of particular three benefits. These ecosystems are, in fact, part of the cultural heritage of Belize, and so people care about them for their intrinsic value as well as the um, services, ecosystem services they provide. So we include this set of metrics as the shared objectives by which to compare the um, various scenarios for the future. Okay, and so now the next slide shows the um, conceptual diagram of the modeling approach that we used. And so as I showed um, in my first slide, we developed a set of scenarios, conservation, the informed management, the development scenario. And then we used a classic risk assessment approach to understand how these three habitats that are really foundational for providing ecosystem services, coral and mangroves and seagrass, um, the extent to which they are, would be at risk of degradation under the three different scenarios. And then we use those estimates of risk to habitats um, and fed those into a suite of ecosystem service models. So for fisheries, we quantified catch and revenue of spiny lobster. For coastal protection services, we quantified it, the um, potential for area to be area of coastal land to be eroded and the avoided damages that were provided could be provided under coral mangrove and by coral mangroves and seagrass under the different future scenarios. And for tourism, we quantified visitation and expenditure from tourists. So we did that under all, for all the three different scenarios. And then what's really important here is we had this feedback loop where through um, several different rounds of the stakeholder engagement that um, Chantal explained, um, we brought back the results to um, uh, key experts and to the public to understand, one, are these um, metrics that we're using for these services, do they resonate with you? Are these meaningful metrics for understanding how change um, in the uh, um, configuration of these human uses can affect these shared objectives that you told us you cared about? We also wanted to understand, are the, the patterns and the results that our model is producing, are these, uh, do these reflect what you know either from your local experience or from your local models and, and scientific data? And then we wanted to understand, well, what things would we change? Do we actually like the set of results um, that are being produced under these different scenarios? Or do we want to um, use the models to understand how to create an even better um, configuration of and, and zonation of uses for the Coastal Zone Management Plan. Um, and so this schematic here um, just sort of expands out on the previous one to really show that um, there's this intermediate step of producing maps that show spatial variation and risk to the different ecosystems and that those maps um, and that spatial variation gets fed into the service models and the um, results that we produced for ecosystem services were produced both at a national level, which I'll show in a minute, but then also at a regional level. So Chantal had mentioned those 
um, coastal, nine coastal planning regions. And um, we wanted to produce results for each one of those services at the scale of those planning regions um, in order to understand how those different regions um, vary in terms of service production and how um, the production and delivery of services at, on that regional basis can then add up together to um, provide services at a national level. Um, so this next slide here shows an example for um, one of the other set of services, re service results for coastal protection. Um, and this particular model, we actually ran at an even finer scale for different segments along the coast. Um, and we identified those different segments based on both um, on ecological, physical, and um, socioeconomic distinctions. So um, I'm not getting into the guts of all of the different service models in this presentation. I, um, you probably saw the citations on a previous slide, so people can follow up and look at those different service models um, through different papers. And I'm happy to answer more questions about them um, in our question period. But the reason I did want to show a few of these results is to just emphasize that um, the models do take into account a wide variety of different data, and that's important for understanding spatial variation and delivery of the services. So for coastal protection, we need to understand what regions of the coast are most exposed to hazards, like flooding and erosion, and where is the distribution of seagrasses and mangroves and corals along the coast? What areas are sort of higher or lower elevation? And then the role that um, those ecosystems play in terms of reducing hazard depends on those physical variables of exposure. And then their importance in terms of relevance for the coastal communities depends on the extent to which the coastlines developed. So we quantified avoided damages based on the reduction in um, coastal erosion provided by these ecosystems and the value of coastal property. And that value of coastal property varied by region as well. So we needed to know, are these areas developed? And then um, what is the value of the coastal property? We produced um, results that you can see in the bar graph on the right-hand side by um, region following, again, this idea that the plan would be national in scope, but um, really highlight uh, the uniqueness of each one of the coastal planning regions. And then we quantified the um, services for each of the different um, integrated coastal zone management scenarios. So what you can see in the yellow is the avoided damages for the current scenario conservation scenario, the informed management scenario, and the development scenario. What I think is um, important to point out here, following again on my earlier comments, is that um, the results for avoided damages are this combination both of where is their high quality habitat that can help uh, prevent erosion of the coastline, but also where is the highest value property. And so in several cases, the informed management scenario actually has the um, highest return in terms of avoided damages, and, because, and that's because it combines both conservation goals and um, sort of strategic development goals so that it combines the increase in value of coastal property. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty much at my last slide here. Um, and I'll pass it back to Chantal and then Greg. But um, so I wanted to show a few results, and that's you can see on the right hand side that um, we produced results for each one of the services and for functional habitat for the um, current and three future scenarios, and found that the informed management plan, which became the preferred plan for the government, would lead to greater returns from coastal protection and tourism than either conservation or development-oriented plan alone. The preferred plan would lead to greater returns from fisheries and extent of functional habitat than the current management um, configuration. 
So even though the conservation plan um, scenario did lead to um, greater fisheries returns than informed management, so there's that trade-off there that we identified, the informed management plan um, would at least provide an improved return compared to the current situation. And then the preferred or informed management plan improved expect, expected coastal protection by 25% over a previous version of the plan based on stakeholder visions alone and more than double the revenue of lobster fishing. So this is a really important point that I wanted to end on um, and, uh, and sort of harken back to my original earlier comments, which is that the informed management plan was actually developed through iteration of stakeholder engagement and ecosystem service modeling. So we did three different rounds of, um, of, uh, um, of revising that informed management plan in August 2012, November 2012, and August 2013. Um, and through that process, we identified what aspects of the zonation were producing the greatest returns and where we needed to relocate activities. And we used this habitat risk assessment, I mean you can see the figure on the right hand side, to be able to understand where could we reduce exposure of ecosystems to um, human uses in order to reduce the potential for degradation to habitats and enhance the delivery of services. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and I'll um, pass it back to, or let's see. Is it back to Chantal, or is it uh, Greg? Okay, well, I think I'll just, I'll just, Chantal, why don't I just click forward here for you. Um, we should have that implementation cycle for the ICZM plan slide up. Yes. And then you can um, just talk through that, and then we'll hand it to Greg. Yes. Um, the, the, all I wanted to mention here is that, um, yes, it took 18 years to prepare the coastal zone management plan, and the process and um, the terms of five government. Hello. Yeah, we hear you, Chantal. Yes, and um, we've modified it. We've gotten approval from from the cabinet. It um, issues um, forwarding, um, and so we're at the point of. Um, plan effectuation and um, we are implementing, we have a coordinating body set up called the Coastal Zone Advisory Council um, who are the very agents and state actors identified in the implementation plan will be assisting us with monitoring and as per legislation that currently stands we need to revise and update that um, plan um, every four years. Um, I'm just also mindful of the fact that um, Greg has not had a chance to speak yet, and I think that now might be a good time to hand it over to him, and then I can, um, time permitting, um, discuss any questions that others might have. Okay, Greg? all right. Okay, and we've switched over to Greg now. Hi, thanks, Chantal. <clears throat> so if you're able to see my screen, I just wanted to kind of take a step back. Um, my primary role with the Belize project was model development and analysis, but also contributing to some of our science education and technical training uh, efforts. And through this experience, we learned a lot by working with Katie, Chantal, and the rest of the team, and of course from the stakeholders we engaged. Um, but again, taking a step back, we found that so many of the same barriers to using ecosystem service information come up time and time again. And so I'll just kind of flash these on the screen, but ultimately um, it boils down to access or lack of capacity with regards to science, data, decision support technology, and of course governance challenges. And so we started to challenge planners and managers to figure out what specifically did they need and sometimes it was really basic information like maps of habitats or help just managing expectations. Um, so 
In thinking about education and outreach, we know that oceans provide important benefits. Um, the activities you see here underpin the economies of many coastal areas, but also pose risks to ecosystems that deliver such services. And so we began compiling information and tools and case studies like the one from Belize you just heard to help um, individuals navigate through a complex marine planning process using ecosystem services as a lens. And really what we're trying to do here is tease out the relationship between impacts from human activities and how that leads to risk to habitats, as Katie mentioned, and then ultimately how changes in the environment will impact the flow of benefits from nature to people. And so after a few years of development, co-development with partners like CZMAI and others, we've developed this marine planning concierge, which provides useful information, uh, including data, tips, answers to only asked questions, case studies, and tools. And I won't have time to show you all the features, but I want to highlight one in particular, and that's tools. And we're not just talking about decision support tools, like the analytics that Katie showed, but also educational um, exercises and activities for um, what I would call problem-based learning. And so uh, one method we tested to educate people about visualizing opportunities and trade-offs is through game-based learning. And so we wanted to help stakeholders really understand the impacts on ecosystem services and how alternative decisions can have either better or worse outcomes for both people and nature. And so this map you see here on the right is our game board for this social simulation game we call trade-off. And the way the game works is by acting as planners or investors, the players can rearrange human activities on the landscape and learn about the importance of considering impacts that these activities have on ecosystems. And importantly, maximizing the potential for decisions to benefit people's livelihoods. And so we know marine planning is a typically a very complex, time-consuming process. And so in route to developing this integrated coastal zone management plan for Belize, which you just heard about, uh, these simple exercises and sometimes synthesis products served as really an entry point for people to begin to understand our EBM approach and tools. Personally, it helped me stay focused and our team, I believe, maintain momentum to build local capacity in Belize and now other places that we work. And so um, that's one example of what I would call an on-ramp to some of the more analytical tools that we use, understanding how these tools can be used to support decisions. Also, we're working on what I would call more of an off-ramp. Um, and this is an example I'm going to show here, just a video is what we call an online dashboard. This is developed by one of our colleagues at Stanford, Dave Fisher. Um, and I've listed some of the important features of this tool, but in summary, it's an online application geared towards helping a planner or an analyst type begin to make sense of outputs from a tool like Invest. So typically these decision support tools produce these raw, unpolished outputs. And so the tool is programmed to actually automatically summarize common and what we think are somewhat effective metrics through maps and charts to help people get started using these tools without the need for GIS experience. And so here you see our coastal vulnerability tool, which is a very, very simple tool for screening potential opportunities where nature-based strategies could reduce risk to coastal communities, property, and other assets from, from different coastal hazards. Um, so we have that concierge, which provides all these different tools, data, um, other information, which I just gave you a taste for here. And then with that, we've developed this online course. Um, the major case study is this Belize case, which you heard more about, but different than sort of a typical course, it's asynchronous learning, which means it's self-paced and you're not required to join a, join a class at 3 a.m. if you're in a difficult time zone. And so... Um, it's this interactive display, which you can use on your phone or on your desktop. And I'm just going to give you a couple of snapshots of what it looks like. Um, of course, we have our, we've compiled different case studies from around the world. And what's nice about it is it's, it's targeted information, so to help people navigate particular steps in the marine planning process, drawing on examples from these and other cases to help people with scoping their project or compiling data 
or even communication and outreach, drawing on lessons learned from these places. Of course, we also go in, in depth with the Belize case study, which you've heard a lot about today. Um, one thing that I'm excited about is we get the opportunity to really tell stories from people involved in these projects. So when you have um, planning documents or peer review publications, it's not always easy to tell stories like our colleague Maritza here about her role and responsibilities contributing to the Belize project. So we have um, these spotlights of different people who contributed. Also, the course has these optional assessments where you can work through uh, different examples. What's nice about this one is it, it actually enables people to learn um, to make progress on their own projects. So this example is using a worksheet. Um, that learners can identify key stakeholders and actually design a process to involve these individuals. So not just relying on examples from Belize and other cases, but actually making progress on their own projects. We also have details, um, rich media, pictures, videos, testimonials from uh, the case study in Belize, learning more about the tools and the science underpinning this, this uh, project. And then one of the more advanced optional assessments is this actual um, applying the INVEST habitat risk assessment model, which you heard a little bit about today. And so the goal of this is not really to have somebody be an expert in the tool, but instead uh, get their feet wet so that if they were to apply this tool in their own place, they would have the understanding of what are the key inputs, what are the next steps if I actually want to run a model like this in my own study area. And so finally to wrap up, I gave you a little taste of our concierge and our um, online course. The concierge is meant to be sort of a digital textbook for this short course, which we developed with Duke University and funded by the Moore Foundation. Um, but really it's not meant to be a prescriptive sort of this is how you do marine planning, but more the goal is to meet um, learners where they're at. So if you want to just know about stakeholder involvement or how to compile data, you can skip right to that using this modular approach. And so uh, I hope this gives you a little better sense for how we've taken lessons learned from Belize and other places we've worked and trying to replicate this, um, this process in other places around the world. And you can see the link to our concierge where you could sign up for the course as well um, at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so uh, maybe we pass it back to Chantal to conclude, if that works. Okay. Uh, let me make Chantal. Um, Chantal, did you have any slides, or did you just would you just like to speak? Um, the only slide that I wanted to show is um, the link to the coastal zone management plan. If um, right. there are any participants that would like to access it, and so I'll put it in presentation mode and just leave it there. Okay. Hello. Oh, I'm seeing the stakeholder engagement slides, Chantal. With I, I don't see the link. Is it? Okay. Maybe there is a delay, but um, oh, it's probably a delay. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, now I see your your uh, desktop. Okay, Sarah, that we could go ahead and do yeah. questions and while Chantal puts that up. Okay, thank yeah. you, Chantal. Okay, and just remind everyone, you can go in and you can send questions in by typing in them into the uh, the user interface under the questions panel. Uh, yeah, now I see it, Chantal, and and you don't really need to put it in presentation mode. Um, okay. it, so great, thank you. Um, and even though we won't be able to handle a ton of questions uh, today, you, the, the questions will be sent to the speakers. Okay, well great. Um, to start off, uh, one question. Can you elaborate on how you asked the stakeholders how much of where they wanted each activity? Did you, for example, show them a map and ask them to point to where they thought fishing should occur? Or was it more like what, percent of the, uh, what percentage of the shore should be fisheries or something else? Okay, so I guess I'll start and um, Greg and Katie, please feel free to chime in. Um, when we enter these um, communities and, and work with the coastal advisory committees, we first um, took stock of the activities occurring within their specific region. And yes, we did use maps that we asked stakeholders to write on um, and include their recommendations as well as to um, 
share share of the spoken word in terms of um, their vision for what they would want to see happen in their areas. So we had to um, take those maps, um, take the comments, and transform them into that spatial platform. Um, and then, as Katie mentioned, it was an iterative process. So we went back and we um, verified that our transformations were indeed um, in tandem with um, what came out of the consultations. OK. All right, Chantal. Did any, did, uh, Greg or Katie, did you have anything to add? Nope, I think that was okay. great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Chantal. And let's see, another question. Are there any environmental regulations in place, oh, sorry, are any environmental regulations in place already with penalties or jail time or fines for, for Belize? Yes, um, we have a suite of um, legislation that affect um, environmental management, coastal zone management, use of lands, and they do have, um, in some cases, a more um, recently revised ones have um, stiff penalties, um, including jail time, um, and, and that isn't an issue for us. Um, I think where we lag behind compared to other countries is the enforcement of these um, various acts and legislation and, and, and policies. So um, yes, we do, and, and in terms of this process, we took into consideration all those existing legislation. Um, as they affect human use, human activity in the coastal and marine areas of the leaves. Okay, thank you so much, Chantal. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, there's a myriad of climate change models for Belize. Can you please address how climate change considerations were taken into account? Okay, um, we look at climate adaptation needs in the plan, but in terms of the actual um, modeling at the time we um, partnered with the Natural, Natural Capital Project. Um, the data um, availability at the, the scale of Belize, it was, it was too coarse to really draw or extract any um, meaningful modeling exercise for, for this plan. And so we've um, been very upfront in flagging this area as a deficiency, but also noting that we've um, aligned and harmonized with the then existing national climate change um, policy strategy and action plan. So in our um, next cycle to revise the, the coastal plan, we hope to be able to use the available um, climate modeling data available to update um, the plan and to fully address climate adaptation um, concerns and considerations. Okay. One talk, oh, excuse me, can I add to that just for a minute too? Um, I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind in these processes is the time scale and the time horizon. And so the time horizon for this plan is 2025. So we made a decision about where to prioritize our time and effort in terms of the coastal zone management activities with the idea that um, these ecosystems, especially reefs for example, are going to be better able to um, resist climate impacts with um, lower sort of cumulative impacts of other stressors. So we did do some other pilot studies in Belize and asked some slightly different questions that were over a longer time scale, looking at costs and benefits of adapt climate adaptation options that were up to 2100. And so for those exercises, we did incorporate some of the available um, climate models and data and, and project projections in terms of accretion rates for reefs. But for this particular process, given the scope and the magnitude of it and the time horizon to 2025, we limited it to um, the development scenarios. OK, great. Thank you, Katie. Okay. Um, and we'll, we can take a, we can handle at least one more question. Um, let's see, how does this plan relate to the planning for no take marine protected areas in Belize? Okay, <clears throat> in terms of this um, this plan, um, we didn't incorporate 
available information um, in that regard in the plan. So as we went about creating a um, fishing zone, we took into consideration um, existing framework for marine reserves that includes um, that explicitly outlines the no take areas, um, general use zones, um, conservation zones, and in incorporating that into our spatial layer, um, we also respected the, the, the um, legal framework for that. So in planning activities within that zone, if it's a multi-air there, and there's that policy there, um, we made sure that the, the um, use reflected the legislation. OK. All right. Thank you, Chantal. Um, let's see, one more quick question. Uh, how did you select the four-year evaluation cycle? That cycle is something we actually inherited from our, our legislation. And I guess while I'm on the topic, um, coastal zone under um, an adaptation on um, project will be conducting an institutional assessment and a process to review and revise um, its, legisl its current act, the Coastal Zone Management Act and regulations. And so things like the implementation time frame, the conditions for revising the act, all of those um, aspects of the Coastal Zone Management Act will be looked at for its practicality, its feasibility, and how we can improve upon that. But to answer um, the question, it's something that has been the act since 1998. Okay. All right. Thank you, Chantal. And let's sneak in one more question. Um, how receptive has CARICOM, uh, Caribbean countries, been in replicating this model? Okay. Um, I know that the um, Social <laughs> Project has been working with some um, member states of CARICOM, so I don't know if maybe Katie or Greg would want to um, add a little bit of your work with Barbados and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I do think that Caribbean globally is really a leader in integrated coastal zone management. Um, and part of that is because it's a place where there are sort of really close connections between ecosystems and the health of ecosystems and the economy. And so um, we at NACAP have been involved in several different um, coastal zone management, but also sustainable development planning more broadly um, processes uh, throughout the Caribbean. So right now we're doing some work with the Office of the Prime Minister in the Bahamas to develop a sustainable development plan for one of the largest islands in the archipelago, Andros Island. Um, and that works funded by the Inter-American Development Bank. And then um, we have done some work in Barbados in collaboration with the Coastal Zone Management Unit there, also using ecosystem services to inform zoning and, in particular, um, targeting restoration areas for coral reefs. Um, those are the things that, that NACAP's been involved in, but there's certainly lots of other organizations, and I'm, I'm sure there's people on the phone that have been doing um, a lot of different work in the Caribbean. I know that the Nature Conservancy and others have work in Grenada. Um, so I think there is a lot of interest bubbling up um, around using an ecosystem services approach to inform um, coastal zone management and marine spatial planning, and develop, sustainable development planning in the region. <clears throat> OK. Well, thank you, guys. Um, there's a few more questions we weren't able to get to. I'll, I'll go, we'll send those to you after the webinar. But uh, thank you so much, uh, Chantal, Katie, and Greg, uh, for presenting today. It was great learning more about uh, the uh, Belize's plan and how it got made. Um, and we really appreciate you coming here to speak about it. And uh, thank you to everyone who was able to participate today. We hope you can also join us for some of our future webinars. OK. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Bye, and thanks. Thank you, Sarah, for having us.